How y'all doing today? Am I on? Am I on? I'm on. It's a good day, isn't it? It's a good day. Thank you. Um, somebody up here thinks, thinks it's a good day. It's a good day, isn't it? Hello? Hello? There we are. I'm having a good time anyway. It's a good morning, good Sunday morning. Good to be together in the house of God as we come apart and uh, be intentional, intentional about our worship. I want to speak today about spirit-empowered peace. And I want to begin by um, just a, an extended quote from um, Wendell Berry in his book, uh, Jaber Crow, a novel. And it's a book um, on the modern person's pursuit of internal peace. And I, I think it is a, a good point just to start with. He writes, <clears throat> It might seem to you that living in the woods on the riverbank would remove you from the modern world, but not if the river is navigable as ours is. On pretty weekends in the summer, the river's very verge is on the very verge of the modern world. It is a seat in the front row, you might say. On those weekends, the river is disquieted from morning to night by people resting from their work. This resting involves traveling at great speed, first on the road and then on the river. The people are in an emergency to relax. They long for peace and quiet, the peace and quiet of the great outdoors. Their eyes are hungry for the scenes of nature. They go fast in their boats. They stir the river like a spoon in a cup of coffee. They play their radios loud enough to hear above the noise of their motors. They look neither left nor right. They don't slow down or maybe even see an old man in a rowboat raising his lines. As one social commentator put it, <clears throat> is this, in lieu of seeking true fundamental internal peace, we are a society that is chasing false peace. Talked about false peace being uh, the kind of peace that we seek in um, buying new things, a new car, a faster car. I have a friend who has a nice car. Uh, it's a Lexus. It's a nice car. He, he'll only have that two years because um, there is another model that is nicer. He wants a Jaguar. I ask him why you want a Jaguar. Has 12 cylinders. Okay. 12 cylinders. What are you going to do with 12 cylinders? It goes fast. So you live in Coatesville. Where are you going to go fast? He said, by the way, when we had this discussion, and by the way, uh, just a week before, he had, had a, he had gotten a speeding ticket in his Lexus. I, I, why, why do you want? It's, it's, it, it's that restlessness in him that, that something bigger, better, will um, he'll find a kind of peace. Everything will be okay. We seek that. False peace. Faster cars, new houses, cabins in the woods, boats on the lake. Over and over and over again, we spend our energy. I was actually talking to a person who has a Jaguar. Because this is what happens, I think, with many things that we think brings us peace. It, it actually adds stress to our lives. This person has a Jaguar, told me that they had a headlight out, and said to me, guess how much it cost me to fix that headlight? This is a headlight. You know, in my car, you can open the hood, you can reach around, pull a clip off, stick a headlight in, it cost me about 17 bucks to buy a, a halogen light. I said, no, I don't know how much it cost in that, in that Jaguar. Um, $1,200. How many of you, honestly, I want to, how many would that $1,200 added stress to your life instead of taking it away? Um, 
that is actually the kind of pattern we get caught in when we, when we uh, are seeking that false peace, actually thinking we'll be out there in something else, um, when the truth of the matter is most of those things let us down in a way that adds stress to our lives, so we get caught in this kind of mad cycle. Um, now we have stress, so we need, so I think that's why he wants another car. Now we have this stress, so we seek that kind of peace in our life, and that thing lets us down, and our stress levels up, and then we are caught in a cycle where we just can't find peace. It's a mad cycle, and it seems to get worse and worse and worse. Finally, if we don't catch ourselves, false peace actually leads us to crippling anxiety or just complete numbness. We check out as if there is no peace to be found. Paul is talking about peace, but fundamental peace, and I think he offers for us a kind of a three-step process uh, where we might find that spirit-empowered peace. And so Paul, addressing his community and us, says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into, his, into this grace in which we now stand. He begins at the beginning. It is the beginning, I think. It is the beginning for us to understand peace with God. From, Paul suggests from this everything else um, springs is finding that peace with God. And secondly, he lets us know something, that this is um, something that is given to us through justification. We are justified, made right with God. And when we, when we get a hold of that, when we understand that, that allows us to be at peace with God. Now, some time ago, I actually read a story. Some, somebody was, I think, pretty bright. They kind of put it into, um, I think, maybe better language for us to understand. It's justification is one of those theological terms that I'm not sure we finally really get our minds around, but he told a little story. And I, I'm going to ask you to try to imagine this as well. Now, it might be hard. I, I, granted, it might be hard for you to imagine it, as good as you all are. We're all good, right? We're good. We're good people, right? Aren't, okay, there's one person that's good. Thank you. She's good. The rest of you, all right, all right. You miserable cusses anyway. We're good people, right? Yes, we are. I believe that. So it might be hard to imagine, but I want you to try to actually imagine this. That you, um, something clicks, something flips. Something. And, and we live in a world where it can happen. And you actually commit a crime. Not a, not a little thing. Um, you actually commit a crime, a serious crime. That's not who you are. It's out of character. But you commit a crime, and suddenly you know that if you're caught, you're going to go to jail. You're going to end up incarcerated. And, and so... Um, in order to not be caught, you begin to kind of live in the shadows. You, you can't really go home. You go home, they're, they're going to get you. And so you, you, you kind of sneak around behind the bushes. You, you, you know that at any place, anywhere you're seen, the police are going to slap those cuffs on you and haul you off. You're going to go to jail. Imagine the kind of uh, emotional pressure, the, the sense on you that that would be. Uh, hard, hard to breathe when you would uh, maybe see a, a, a police car go by. Uh, kind of freeze emotionally. And then one day, you have to get some food. You can't go home. You, you go into a little minute market, and you're in there hoping nobody recognizes you, and you're trying to get some food to eat. And, and they have a TV on, and you notice all of a sudden there's a news flash, news flash. And across the TV comes that for some reason, you have no idea why, despite that you committed a crime, you deserve to go to jail, for some reason you see the news flash, all charges have been dropped. 
What kind of relief do you think you would feel? What kind of sense of joy to know that you deserve, you deserve to go to jail, you deserve it, but for some reason, the state has dropped charges, you are free, you can step out of the shadows into the light, you can go home uh, filled with that joy. That's why Paul talks about, I think we don't get it, but that's why Paul talks about this justification that God offers us through the act of Jesus Christ, why he talks about it with language that is filled with excitement and joy because he seems to get what we don't seem to grasp. He can walk in the light, not bent over in the shadows. He is free. He's free in Jesus Christ. It is offered to him a gift. And because of that gift, he, he is filled with the joy and excitement of, of Jesus Christ. That is opposed, of course, um, trying to seek that peace without being at peace with God. And that's kind of, honestly, and maybe none of you have experienced it, but that's kind of where I come from. That, I come from out of that tradition. Methodist, but a little old Methodist church where I was taught, you know what, you had, to, you had to walk the fine line. You had to make sure you didn't deviate. You didn't go this way. You didn't go that way. We were taught that God was this God, you know, always there waiting, waiting for us to step out of line. So it could crush us like a bug. We would end up, you know, uh, in eternal reality. It was rather warm. And you can't be at peace with a, with a God that you are so afraid of that you do some little thing, you are suffering terrible consequences. But that's, that's, what, that's what many people were taught. That's not God, according to Paul. Paul is not that God um, with his arms outstretched holding us away from him, waiting for the opportunity to gun us down because of what we have done. Rather, those arms outstretched from this almighty God are arms that are seeking to embrace us, to encircle us, to pull us into that loving relationship. And when we, when we finally grasp it, what Paul's talking about, when we finally grasp that, we can be at peace with God, for we know this God is not a God out to get us. This is a God that is out to support us and encourage us and nurture us and move us forward. And we can finally be at peace with our divine God. And it is only when we are at peace with our God that Paul suggests that the next step is possible. Again, let's listen to Paul. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured in, out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul says, then, when we recognize that what God has done for us, as miserable as we can be, that what God has done for us in, in the Lord Jesus Christ justified us, that we can find ourselves at peace with this God, it leads to this second step. It leads to the peace of God being who we are. And that means a couple of things. And the first thing I think for us, that means um, peace of mind. Finally being able to, to, to be at peace with ourselves. Uh, uh, I know many, many, many people who, who, whose mind, they can't shut it down. It just runs on and runs on and runs on and is worried about this and worried about that. There's not enough stuff to be worried about today. We'll borrow from weeks down the road, be worried about things that might happen. Somebody said to me the other day, how come you're not worried about this? It's an issue coming up. How come you're not worried about this? And I said, you know what? It's enough today. If in six months I need to worry about that, in six months there'll be time to worry, won't there? We know that. And so um, finding that peace of mind where we don't, uh, it doesn't run on, we don't beat ourselves up, peace of mind, but you know what? We play a part in this. Paul has always said this. Paul says this consistently. We play a part in this. That peace of mind is something that, that um, we, first of all, have to pray for and seek and want. But there are things that we can do. That's the part we play, the things that we do. Peace of mind. When was the last time? Can you, can you remember the last time, for instance, that you actually 
um, spent meditating on God. The spiritual discipline of meditation. Reading a passage of scripture and then taking not um, five seconds, five minutes, a serious time um, reflecting. That's called meditating. Meditating on that scripture uh, uh, so that we might uh, spend that time with God, meditating, silencing the mind. When was the last time you practiced the spirit of, of, um, of, of, of quietness? That's actually a, a spiritual discipline uh, where you are just quiet with yourself, with your God, perhaps in nature. Uh, some time ago, it's been a little while ago now, I decided to take a, a, a class on quietness, the spiritual discipline of quietness. It was in a um, Catholic, Catholic uh, monastery down near uh, Reading. It was a week. It was a, for a week. All of us that were a part of it, all of us who decided to sign up, for a week, we moved in silence. We didn't talk to each other. We got up in the morning and we ate breakfast without saying a word. We spent uh, uh, time uh, in our rooms in prayer and time walking through the nature that was a part of it, a week of not saying a thing, the spiritual discipline of quietness. Be still. The Old Testament tells us, be still and know that I am God. Amen? If we seek that true peace, that fundamental internal peace, rather than the false peace, it means that, that we, we actually take this serious enough to, to put into play, practice some of these spiritual disciplines that might actually help us grow into that place where I think God wants us to be. This then becomes a peace that is not dependent on any way to um, our circumstances out around us. So many people so often tell me, well, if this wasn't going on, or if I didn't have that to deal with, or so-and-so didn't say this, or you name it, uh, I, might be able to, I might be able to get there because we don't understand that that fundamental peace of God has nothing to do with our external circumstances whatsoever. And if we continue to hinge our sense of peace on when the world gets peaceful around us, we are never going to experience this peace that Paul says is offered to us, has been offered to us by Almighty God, a free gift. It, it implies we pray for it. Batterson tells us that when we pray, uh, if our prayers are just for ourselves, those are a little selfish, but if we pray for these gifts, God will give them to us. God will be at in helping us attain this so that we might actually live in this world with the peace of Almighty God. And you know what? That kind of peace is absolutely attractive. People want that peace. People want to be around people who have that kind of peace. Many of you, probably most of you, don't know Ken Staver. For me, Ken Staver is the greatest example of this kind of peace. Ken Staver, a wonderful uh, teacher of this church, a wonderful man who's gone to be with the Lord for some years now, but he, he was a person who was utterly at peace with God. And that led to the place where he lived the peace of God. And you knew that when you were in his presence. You felt it. You heard it in his voice and in his concern. I describe it kind of like uh, getting into a pool. And I'm, 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 I'm not a person who likes cold water in a pool. I like warm water. I like bath water. I want to get in a pool, somebody throw me a bar of soap, I'm okay. You understand? I want to be that warm. And that's what it was like to be around Ken. Uh, because water, you feel it. It envelopes you. But guess what? You can feel that spirit envelope you when you're in the presence of those people who are, are, are uh, with God in peace and, are, and, and experience the peace of God. It draws you to them. And we all can have that same kind of peace, and we all can be those people who, who live the peace of Almighty God in this world 
And if you want to witness, there is no better way than to be that non-anxious presence, that wonderful presence in the midst of a world that is literally in chaos. Paul says it's ours. It's ours by the offering of Almighty God when we also are serious enough about it to, to practice those disciplines. But, and here's another big one for us, it is not an end in itself. Experiencing the peace of God, being that person who, who lives the peace of God, in our selfish world, we need to understand something. It's not doing this so that the end is, I am uh, experiencing the peace of God. It, it, the outcome of this is the end, it is, is peaceable living. Remember, we always play a part in this world. It is not us individually. We are a part of the greater world. We are called to live in the world in such a way that we uh, reflect the person of Jesus Christ. And so the end is, is that, is that we, um, we live that peaceable life in this world. Again, uh, Ken Staver is the greatest example for me um, who, who was never caught up in the anxiety or the problems or the issues. You could go there. It's a safe place. It is not an end in itself. We are called uh, to make a difference in this world. In Romans 12, 18, Paul tells us that we are to live this peaceable life with everyone. We are, we are to choose to do it. We are to choose to live this out in a way that makes a difference in the world that we want. For Paul, again, this is not a static reality. This is a lived into reality. And then lastly, and I think very, very important for us, particularly people in the church, we are to be God's peacemakers. Being at peace with God, experience the peace of God, living out that peace of God in the world, and we are to be the peacemakers. And, and what that means is this. Sometimes in the world we live in, we might have to go to war. I don't care what political, I don't care where you're at politically. Sometimes we might have to. But for you and I, that has to be the absolute last option. We are peacemakers, amen? We have to sue for peace and sue for peace. And when it looks like it's too late, sue for peace and sue for peace and tell maybe at some point we might have to go to war. But we hold out for peace, the peace of God in this world. We hold out to the very end so that we might be God's peacemakers. Amen. Please stand and join us.